Okay, this is another lecture in Texas history, uh, Texas History 2301 particularly, and uh, this is Nathan Giesenschlag. Today we look at the life and times of Stephen F. Austin. He is popularly known as the father of Texas, but Stephen F. Austin, of course, comes to Texas uh, after having been uh, born and after having uh, grown to adulthood. We pick up Austin's uh, life and times uh, with a brief review of his father. Now, Moses Austin was a schemer and a dreamer, and uh, Moses Austin had grand designs and hopes for his family. In fact, he wanted his family to go down in history as one of the more prominent families, perhaps in Missouri, where they were, or maybe even in the history of the United States. And uh, if we look back now here at the, uh, at the life of Moses and Stephen Austin, the Austin clan, the answer is, well, I, I guess he got what he wanted because of the fact that you have major, a major city in the United States, a capital city uh, of a major state, uh, or any state for that matter would be important, but named for uh, this family, Austin, Texas, of course. But Moses Austin, by the time where we pick him up today and we remember about him, is we're looking at about the year 1820. Moses Austin is in his mid-50s in 1820, and he travels uh, really without invitation, travels on a hope and a prayer, so to speak, and he travels to San Antonio de Bejar in 1820, November of 1820, uh, to uh, convince the governor of Bejar, Antonio Martinez, to fund and more particularly to allow the introduction of Anglo settlers into Texas. Well, Antonio Martinez, who is the Spanish governor, it's not Mexican Texas yet, Antonio Martinez takes a dim view of this visitor to Bejar. Uh, the San Antonio, this uh, visitor here, uh, came uninvited. And uh, despite the fact that Moses Austin had been a subject of the crown of, uh, to the crown of Spain uh, back in the uh, late 18th century in about 1798, and that he held a Spanish passport and citizenship, uh, Martinez was not impressed. In fact, actually, Martinez looks at uh, Austin, Moses Austin, and basically says to him, and uh, sizes him up and says, uh, I don't want your type around here. Because what had happened in the previous uh, decade or so, uh, arguably the previous two decades, had been that there had been these adventurers showing up in Texas, these adventurers, and I, that that doesn't really do it justice. The word is filibuster. We think of the filibuster in the Senate sense, the U.S. Senate, but these filibusters are irregular dreamers. They are schemers. They are uh, paramilitary types, uh, militia types, uh, to use a phrase, uh, who are going to be infiltrating and uh, like barnacles or parasites on Spanish Texas. Uh, these folks are trying to dislodge Texas and pull it away from Spain, or New Spain if you want, uh, and maybe attach it to the United States, maybe set up their own personal fiefdom, and so on. One of these uh, dreamers and schemers is a fellow named James Long, and in 1819, he had just uh, tried to uh, create uh, this movement in Texas. He fails uh, and is one of those filibuster types, Philip Nolan, Augustus McGee, uh, and, uh, and so on. There are quite a few of them, and most of them, in fact, the vast majority of them are are Anglo. And so there is a chauvinism, there is a prejudice against Anglos coming to Texas because of what the, what the small sample size had been to that point in time. Most of the Anglos that seem to come to Texas are these uh, sort, these ne'er-do-well sorts or these uh, devious sorts you don't want around them and you don't want around your uh, territory. And so the governor, uh, Antonio Martinez, uh, basically says to Moses Austin, get out of town. But as we know, uh, Moses Austin is going to walk out of the governor's office, and just by accident, he's going to, I say accident, I think it's frankly providence, but whatever the exact reason why. But uh, the thing is, is that Moses Austin is going to come into and meet uh, just by accident a man that he'd met only 20 years before and only for one night, and that is Philip Henry Nering Bagel. But the thing is, is that we don't know him as that. We know him as the Baron de Bastrop. The Baron de Bastrop is, of course, the namesake of Bastrop, Texas, and uh, that's just right outside of uh, right outside of Austin, Texas, the namesake of the county, Bastrop County. Anyways, uh, the Baron and uh, Moses Austin had met 20 years before, uh, had run into each other quite by accident at a bar or tavern in a restaurant, frankly, in New Orleans when Moses was selling uh, lead down in New Orleans. Anyways, they strike up a conversation, and the baron basically says, and he was not really a baron, that was the title he accepted and took, and people didn't question him too much about it. 
And the Baron basically says to Austin, he says, what you doing here? And Moses Austin explains his designs uh, and explains his desire to help Texas uh, recover from the revolution, to grow and to, to populate. And he, Moses Austin, explains that he wants to bring Anglo settlers to Texas. And by extension, bringing those settlers to Texas means you're going to have economic activity. You're going to raise the standard of living overall. Perhaps maybe you develop uh, some cotton production in Texas, which also means cotton refining or cotton ginning in Texas and so seed mills and such. All that to say is, is that there are opportunities for Behar to become a more wealthy town. Behar in 1820, or San Antonio to Behar in 1820, is not wealthy at all. It's not abjectly poor, uh, but it is certainly no, uh, no one's uh, understanding. No one would look at it and say, oh, you're just a, a few dollars short of being like Paris, or you're a few dollars short of being like Venice or some other great wealthy uh, uh, imagined city. The thing is, is that the Baron says, I can, I can help you out on it. That sounds like a good idea. And let me take you to meet my a good friend, the Governor Antonio Martinez. I can help you out. And as they say, you know, in life, sometimes it's not what you know, but who you know. And that has always been the case, I guess, since the beginning. Sometimes it is what you know. And then also it's sometimes what you, or rather who you know and who can open the door for you. And if you, and the expression I've taken to use, and it's an expression I picked up here in the last few months, it's a good one. I, I try not to use it too much, but I think this is appropriate here, is, is that sometimes uh, the expression is small hinges uh, swing uh, open big doors. And in the case of uh, the Baron de Bastrop, who, had it not been for his uh, uh, running into Moses Austin 20 years before, just these seemingly inconsequential passages of the proverbial ships in the night, uh, the thing is, is that at, without the Baron's help, without Moses Austin's help, Texas history t turns out very differently. Uh, how differently, we don't know, uh, because it didn't happen that way. But we do know that just this accidental meeting in the streets of San Antonio changes the trajectory of Texas forever. Uh, and Moses Austin gets the green light after having the Baron introduce him and the Baron vouch for Moses Austin. And Governor Martinez says, boy, that does really sound like a good idea. I am willing to give you a shot. Go ahead and prepare to, and start making preparation to bring people to Texas and settle them in Texas. And Moses Austin is extraordinarily happy. Moses Austin will spend the next 10 days or so in Behar getting ready and meeting individuals. The Baron takes him around town, and San Antonio is only a city of about 1,500 to 2,000 individuals at that point. So it's not really, uh, as nobody's example of a, you know, it's not big compared to Paris or London or some other uh, major city. The thing is, is that though the Baron takes him around, meets all the important individuals in town, one se uh, family name you probably ought to remember is the family Seguin. It's spelled S-E-G-U-I-N. -E -E Seguin, Texas is named for one of the, the boys in that family, Juan Seguin. Uh, but the thing is, is Erasmo is a, a very uh, prominent family. He's one of the patrons in the com community. Uh, he's one of the leaders in that community. And when the Seguin family says, uh, yes, this sounds good, that a lot of folks are going to follow suit. And so anyways, all which is to say is, is that Moses Austin meets a lot of individuals, stirs up a lot of excitement, and really is, in a sense, it's a, kind of a dawning of a new day. But Moses Austin has to travel back to Missouri, and that's where, remember, the Austin clan is headquartered at at that point in time. And so they are headquartered in, in Missouri. Stephen, whom we'll spend most of the time talking about in this lecture today, Stephen Austin is actually down in New Orleans uh, trying to uh, reconstruct his life, and he's not in, in Missouri at all. Yet Moses Austin has a, a dream and a desire for him. Moses Austin, we might call the grandfather of Texas, and he says, uh, and he sends a letter to his son Stephen, basically says, oh, by the way, Stephen, I want to let you know I've got a new gig in Texas. I am going to uh, start introducing settlers into the United States. And Stephen Austin, or excuse me, Moses Austin sends letters to that effect all throughout the United States announcing this new settlement scheme. Come to Texas, get cheap or free land, uh, be, uh, be a Spanish citizen or subject. However, uh, there's new opportunity. And Moses Austin also continues with his son in, in a series of letters, in fact, basically entreating his son, begging his son, and maybe not quite commanding his son, but certainly pleading with his son, come help me in Texas. Son, I need your help. And so Moses Austin, here we are right around Christmas, uh, really uh, December of 1820 now. 
Moses Austin leaves out of Behar with his slave. Moses Austin was a slave owner. He leaves out of Austin with a slave and this unknown traveler. Uh, unknown to them. We don't know the man's name. But uh, Moses Austin, this slave, and this one other fellow are going to travel northeast out of, out of San Antonio to Behar along El Camino Real. Uh, and basically, El Camino Real, the main, one of the two major uh, roads throughout Texas. Uh, and I say road, I use that very loosely because El Camino Real, like the La Bahia tre Trace, really isn't a, uh, a real road. It's a, a pathway. It's sometimes not even a pathway. It's just grass. Uh, other times, and understand this, unlike, say, Highway 21, Highway 36, uh, 290, the LBJ Freeway or North Central Expressway, Mopac, uh, Loop 410 or whatever, most of you watching this were going to come from one of those four cities that I just rattled off. Maybe Fort Worth. Everybody forgets Fort Worth, though. The thing is, is that when it comes to those major uh, thoroughfares, I mean, those are defined right-of-ways and those are defined roads. Uh, in Texas in 1820, or in, even into the middle part of the 19th century, a lot of these roads will wiggle just like the tail of a dog. And they will wag just like uh, on a cat. And they'll go here and they'll cross the river there and, and move, uh, you know, 10 miles upstream or whatever. So when we talk about El Camino Real, uh, and that's true for a lot of these little uh, roads and traces, uh, they move around. There's not a, there's, they're not paved is my point, I guess. So anyways, they travel up through East Texas or travel through Central Texas and somewhere probably close to Palestine. Uh, and by the way, if you've ever seen that on a map, you may think, oh, is it pronounced Palestine, Texas? If you ever, if it's, you know, like in any territory, you can figure out uh, who's the locals. Uh, one of the ways you figure out who's local and who's not is how they pronounce local words. Uh, in Texas, it's not Palestine, it's Palestine. But somewhere in East Texas, maybe around Palestine, maybe even as far east as Jacksonville or Henderson, uh, these men are traveling and this unknown companion of Moses Austin, unknown to Moses Austin and to us, robs Austin uh, basically at gunpoint and steals everything from Austin and the slaves uh, that they have except the clothes on their back. And the thing is that this is in December of 18 and uh, 20. And so it is cold. It's frank, frankly damp and cold. And we're talking about a 55 or so year old man. And then one thing you always got to remember is, is that the, there are some, uh, to us today, it's not nearly as bad. Um, the, the thing is, is that uh, in normal circumstances, out excluding the COVID issues with lungs, the thing is, is that uh, when you talk about some of the great killers of antiquity and the great killers of pre-modern uh, medicine, one of them was the issue of pneumonia. Others, of course, would be yellow fever, malaria, and so forth in a Texas sense. Another one would be very common. Lots of people uh, succumb to this over the years. Uh, even into the 20th century, they'll succumb to it until antibiotics really knock it, that, knock it down, and that is tuberculosis. Uh, but Moses Austin, 55 years old, and uh, as I've said before to you, Moses Austin is living on borrowed time. Uh, I, I say that because statistically you look at these men and you say, okay, something's probably going to kill them, uh, whether it's pneumonia, which is oftentimes uh, the thing that does kill these old men. Uh, I would put this in your notes. It's, uh, in fact, uh, some, it's got some nicknames. Uh, it's kind of those gallows humor nicknames that you get. And one of one for uh, pneumonia is the old man's best friend because the death is relatively quick and it's relatively painless. It's not like uh, being eaten alive with a particularly grievous form of cancer where you're just in agony and pain for seemingly uh, too long. Or tuberculosis, which is in its own right very bad because you sit there and cough and cough and cough, but slowly but surely tuberculosis eats at the lungs, forms those turbicles, and eventually start coughing up blood and other, uh, other issues. And that takes a while for tuberculosis to kill you. Uh, Jimmy Rogers of, of country music fame would be an example there. But anyways, uh, Moses Austin, wet, cold, damp, old, uh, he gets pneumonia. And uh, he crashes uh, a, a cabin in sparsely populated East Texas uh, in the town of Nacogdoches. And for the better part of a, couple, a month or two, uh, Moses Austin is closer to death than he is to life. Yet at the end of the day, Moses Austin is an extraordinarily uh, tough bird. Uh, he's a tough man. And Moses Austin is going to get up off of his own sickbed and then travel on by the spring, the late spring of 1821 now. He's going to travel on to Missouri and he's going to resume his uh, efforts to move to Texas. Problem for Moses Austin is, is that Moses Austin is running six ways to Sunday. He is going crazy. Uh, he is busy, busy, busy. 
Uh, and uh, the man is trying to wrap up all his old business dealings. He's trying to get rid of uh, old debts. He's trying to, you know, basically close up shop, sell his place, and move on. But, you know as well as I do, an old man who has uh, bad lungs, scarred lungs left over from pneumonia, uh, are going to be susceptible to more pneumonia. And that's ultimately what ends up happening, is, is that Moses Austin is going to succumb to a second bout of pneumonia because he'd overworked himself and overrun, uh, overrun himself, and he did not stop. So, I mean, if you ever catch pneumonia, some of you have had it, uh, you know you're always going to be a little more susceptible to it uh, just because of what pneumonia does to the lungs and the lung tissue. Well, anyways, he, uh, Austin, goes back to, or rather Moses Austin dies. But shortly before he dies, and he knows he's dying, uh, he, I th he basically, as I understand the story, uh, Moses and any reasonable man of that period would understand that you don't normally get two bites at the cherry. Uh, he beat pneumonia once, and he's not going to beat it a second time. He's too weak, he's too worn down, he's too old. And so he's dying, and he knows it, and he sends his boy, Stephen, who's still, like I said, down in New Orleans. He sends him a letter uh, here in late 1821, basically saying to his son, Son, I'm dying. Son, I want you to pick up the pieces for me. Son, I need your help. I, I cannot complete my task. I and I want you to pick up, and I want you to come to Texas, and I want you to, be, uh, to, to fulfill my destiny, in a sense. Uh, it is, an to me, an extraordinary uh, letter from a father to son, from the dying to the living sort of idea that the dying uh, could impose upon uh, the living uh, his wishes and dreams. Extraordinary, not like, and you can't do that. Uh, that has been done by, uh, by parents to sons and grandparents to, to grandchildren over the, the, the long term of humanity. Uh, son, I'm not going to make it. You need to fulfill my destiny. And it, whatever the exact destiny was supposed to be, you've seen that many times. But the thing is, is that Stephen Austin had been uh, associated with his father, of course, all his life. And he knew his father was a schemer and a dreamer. Some of the schemes worked, most of them fell apart, uh, some of them spectacularly so. The land scheming in Missouri had fallen apart, especially after the Panic of 1819. Stephen Austin had participated in land speculation as well, and Stephen Austin had lost a lot of money in land. Uh, Stephen Austin uh, was, uh, in a sense, trying to live a quote-unquote normal life and not be so much of this, uh, uh, this uh, I guess you say, ne'er-do-well uh, sort of way that um, Moses seemingly chased. But it's also fair to say, too, is, is that where we find Stephen Austin in, in the uh, turn of the year 1822, and remember, things t are slower back then. You can't just send emails and everything works quickly. Send letters and it works slowly. But where we find Stephen Austin in 1822, we find Stephen Austin in New Orleans, and all he is is a glorified clerk. He is a glorified legal clerk. He's got some lawyerly training, uh, he, but at the same time, he's a clerk. And there doesn't seem to be a future for him in New Orleans, or if there is a future for him, it is very, very limited. So on the one hand, it is an imposition of Moses uh, upon his son to send uh, this letter saying, son, fulfill my destiny. But at the other hand, and it's the bigger hand now, the more important other side is, is that Stephen Austin, who had, been Im who had imbibed from childhood this notion that Austins were important individuals, Austins were uh, destined to become something, uh, Stephen Austin looks at what he is and looks what Texas could be if everything works out right, then that would be uh, a much, uh, you know, it might be worth uh, looking into and might go, uh, be worth going to. So Stephen Austin collects, him, collects his things. Stephen Austin leaves New Orleans, goes up by the Red River, and crosses into Texas. Now, some of you are more geographically attuned to, the, to East Texas than others, and you might think, why didn't he travel westward just straight like I-10 runs west toward Beaumont, Port Arthur, Lake Charles, and that part of the world if you're at New Orleans? Well, the thing is, is that uh, that part of Louisiana, southwest Louisiana, was largely unpopulated, and it was hard to cross because of the swamps, terrains, and so on. And besides, going up the Red River was much more comfortable uh, and, frankly, safer overall, whether from disease or banditry uh, than trying to travel through uh, through uh, south excuse me southwest Louisiana or East Texas, and so you go up through Red River, you pass through Marshall, you come down the uh, El Camino Real, and you pass through and you're on your way to San Antonio. Uh, 
Well, anyways, Moses, excuse me, Stephen Austin uh, ful- tries to fulfill his father's destiny. And Stephen Austin is going to be in, in uh, Behar, and he's going to see Texas in the springtime. And see, if you actually go back and you read the letters of Stephen Austin going back to family members in Missouri and elsewhere, uh, and Stephen Austin promoting this dream as well as he's starting to adopt it for himself, Austin is going to basically say Texas was one of the most beautiful places he'd ever seen. And he's traveling through East Texas. The problem I've seen over the years is that, and this is just an aside, is to say if you've seen this uh, in... uh, in Hollywood, they talk about Texas being beautiful and Texas being lush and Texas be having, you know, planting a land and all that sort of thing. And then when you say, then, then they show a picture of Texas, they have this concept of Texas basically looking out toward Pecos or something and really might even be Arizona. My point is this, is that a lot, for a lot of outsiders, and some of you already know this, they think of Texas as basically cows uh, and mountains and desert, which of course East Texas and even Central Texas, frankly, is not. And so Mo, Stephen Austin is impressed by what he sees. Stephen Austin gets to, uh, to uh, San Antonio de Bejar. He meets with the Seguin family. He meets with other Bejarinos. Uh, and he is uh, basically told there's been a revolution in Mexico. It's finally over. And uh, you're going to have to change. You're going to have to find out what, what that means. Because what was promised by the Spanish may not be fulfilled by the Mexican Congress. You need to go to Mexico City. And so Stephen Austin is going to have to take a trip. Austin, as you'll find out, Stephen Austin is one of those individuals who travels and travels quite well. And if you look at Austin's life compared to most people, Austin will, have, will travel all over the North American continent. You'll find him twice in Mexico City. You'll find him at multiple times in the east, and whether Washington, D.C. or around New York or what have you. Austin was a bit, I won't say he's a tumbleweed, but he's certainly a bit of a traveler, and he's not afraid to, he's, to move around. He's not a homebody. And so Austin is going to make his plans, and Austin, Stephen Austin is going to go to Mexico City to find out what this uh, change of government really means. For the early months of, in the early months of 1822, St- Stephen Austin is going to travel with about uh, 30 men down to Mexico City. Traveling to Mexico City overland could be easy, but it was often not. In fact, actually traveling to Mexico City could be quite perilous if it wasn't uh, the, the best of traveling conditions. One of the problems you had with uh, traveling to Mexico City from Texas was simply the length. Uh, we're talking at least a one-month journey and oftentimes closer to two. Uh, you have to stop along the route. Some of the roads are uh, non-existent. Uh, and then more particularly, the threats along the route are going to be bandits and also Indians. In fact, about a week into the trip, excuse me, not even a week, a couple of nights into the trip, Austin is going to be traveling south here in the spring of 22, and he is going to be uh, in uh, basically somewhere close to Eagle Pass, as I understand it, but basically in that brush country there close to the Rio Grande, and he and his outfit are going to be attacked, and I use that word loosely now, they're going to be surrounded by some Comanches. Well, they were spared, and they weren't completely stripped naked or anything like that, and the caravan moved on. Down through Mexico they go, and down eventually into Mexico City. And we find uh, Stephen Austin in Mexico City by the time you get to about May 1822. Stephen Austin, uh, when he gets to Mexico City, to uh, his credit, and this is really worth noting because when we talk about Austin, impresario, or soon-to-be impresario Austin, Stephen Austin has become more and more convinced that this is something he needed to do. There was real opportunity in Mexican Texas for him to really establish his name and to, uh, frankly, become wealthy. And uh, one of the ways he had to do it was he had to ingratiate himself with the the Mexican government and the local Hispanic uh, community. And that's true in Bejar, it's true in Mexico City, and it's true in the state of Coahuila, which is going to be Texas and Coahuila are going to be latched together once more under, in Mexican law in this case. The thing is, is that Austin is going to do his level best uh, to adopt much of the, uh, the well, he's going to try to make sure that everybody in Mexico knows that he is a, he wants to be a loyal Mexican citizen, and more particularly, he wants to do it by the book. He doesn't want the stench or the stink of the filibuster attached to him. And so one of the ways Austin is going to do this is that he is going to learn Spanish. 
that man is going to make a concerted effort uh, to learn Spanish, which, of course, is the language of Mexico. Uh, I'd have to check. I don't think it's actually f- official, but it didn't even, that, that doesn't matter, really, because all the language of Mexico is going to be Spanish. And so Austin uh, quits, uh, at least when he's uh, dealing with those who are uh, of uh, Spanish, or, excuse me, Hispanic uh, origin, or Spanish is their main language. And, he, and especially when he starts signing official documents, uh, Stephen Austin does not sign his name Stephen. He signs it Esteban, Esteban, Esteban. And it was his way of signaling to anybody who was caring to, to look and see, it was his way of signaling, you have nothing to worry about me. I'm not like some of my other compatriots. That doesn't mean he adopts uh, full-on uh, Hispanic uh, dress and attire for the time period. To my knowledge, he basically does not. Not to say he doesn't buy from uh, shops in Mexico City or anything like that, but at the same time, uh, at the end of the day, he wants everybody to understand he is uh, a peaceable uh, citizen of Mexico, or he wants to be a peaceable citizen of Mexico, who wants to help Mexico and effectively uh, help Mexico become a more prosperous young nation. Uh, Additionally speaking, uh, Austin isn't just going to use Spanish as a language, but he's also very deferential. Uh, He understands that he is in the minority by far, and he has to work with, and he has to be very, uh, uh, I say pleasing might be the wrong word, but he certainly has to please uh, those who are in authority. And this is really one of the major differences between him and his father. Stephen Austin had been trained as a a lawyer-to-be. He had gotten good education from uh, those schools that he attended as a grade school uh, child and then later on as a uh, young adult. Uh, He'd gone to some university. Uh, He was quite literate and quite good, and uh, his personality and temperament was not like his father's. Uh, Moses Austin, for all of what he was, uh, that uh, that kind of trailblazer mentality also tends to have a bit of a bull in a china closet aspect to him. And Moses Austin could make some in- enemies in addition to winning friends. And Stephen Austin, too, could make some enemies. He'll have them uh, in his time in Texas, uh, but that's just part of being in, the, in charge. But one of the things that I, I'm convinced that Stephen Austin uh, was far, far better suited to do versus his father in Mexico City, was to deal with the Mexican government. Uh, The Mexican government in 1822 was uh, just setting up, uh, for all intents and purposes, you'd had some provisional governments. Uh, You had a provisional government prior to the the coronation of Augustin I, Augustin de Iturbide, uh, who's going to be the first emperor, the first head of state, the formal head of state of Mexico. Uh, And uh, the thing is, you're going to have uh, what amounts to a, a rump congress, in Mexico under Iturbide. And so what ends up happening is is that Austin, Stephen Austin, has to navigate all these different shoals and all these different rapids of Mexican politics, not to mention the fact that he has to deal with an emperor who is dealing with things far more important uh, in his mind than what's going on in Texas. Uh, So Austin has to have a lot of patience. Stephen Austin had to have the patience that uh, Moses probably wouldn't have had. And then there were, by the way, there are going to be others that we're not going to deal with in this course, but there are going to be other wannabe impresarios. There are going to be other wannabe uh, land agents running around Mexico City uh, trying to influence and get their own land grants. And frankly, what you find out is is that some of them are really just... uh, 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 stiff-necked uh, tex- st- stiff-necked Americans, and they try to play get high-handed with the Mexicans, and it doesn't go so well for some of them, meaning they don't get the contracts. Others get their contracts because they contracted with Austin to intercede on the behalf. Austin was really good at politics. I guess is what I'm trying to say. He he was really good at it, and Austin understood what he was, which was in essence a small-time man. Uh, and I don't mean that as a uh, as a slap or a slur at Austin, but in my reading of his history and his his actions in Mexico City, is is that Austin understood what uh, he wasn't. He was not a big man. He's not an important individual in the eyes of many Mexicans. And he comes from a part of Mexico that's on the frontier, uh, to borrow uh, Don Fraser's term, uh, which is their t- meaning the the Mexican or Spanish term. But he's coming from a a, a territory or a state. Uh, that is uh, very uh, detached from Mexico City. 
Uh, and especially considering the tyranny of distance uh, that you have in the sense that there is no uh, instantaneous communication, uh, there is no railroads or cars or planes that can get you to Texas rather quickly. Uh, travel from Texas to Mexico City, as I've already indicated, at le is at least a month-long proposition. All of which is to say is, is that uh, if you want to think of it in an American sense, uh, what is it analogous to? Uh, for many Americans, especially those Americans in Washington, D.C. or Philadelphia or New York, uh, the, out, the outer realm of nowhere, meaning almost like the outer realm of the universe sort of thing, would be, say, North Dakota or Montana or, or some uh, maybe Alaska. That would be uh, an extreme example, but I think you get the picture. And Austin realizes that's the case. And so he has to be careful. Austin has to be careful about trying to get too pushy, and patience is the order of the day. And Austin is patient. My gosh, is that man patient. However, it pays off in the fact that between what Augustin de Iturbide, or Augustin I, uh, the Emperor of Mexico, agrees to, the uh, rump congress under uh, uh, Iturbide uh, belches out, I say that's kind of a pejorative term, but the law, uh, a colonization law that they put out, uh, and later uh, a secondary colonization law affirmed by a new Mexican congress after Iturbide is deposed and abdicates, uh, this Austin gets what he wants. He is going to do okay, at least when it comes to land. I guess that's uh, the thing is, is that you find Austin in Mexico City. He's down there for the better part of 13 months, uh, maybe closer to 14 months, but he gets what he wants. He gets his land contract. He gets uh, all this legal stuff straightened out, so Austin knows that he can't mm -hmm. offer deeds and title to land. Um, and so anyways, all of which is to say Austin is doing just fine. Uh, he, he will not be, uh, Austin will never be a a wealthy man in the term of money, but he will be land rich in a sense. But uh, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of possessions. You just have a lot of land, which may or may not actually have value. Anyways, as we get closer to 1823, now 1824, uh, moving the story along with Stephen Austin, we find Austin uh, back in Texas, and we find Austin having already announced to the world, like his father had done, but especially uh, there in New Orleans and Natchez and so on, basically saying, come to Texas and get cheap and available land. Uh, remember this, part of what is going to drive people to Texas is the issue of uh, not just cheap and available land, but the issue of the Panic of 1819 back in the United States. As I've said to you before, the Panic of 1819 was nationwide, but it was far more acute. It was far more severe in the western United States up and down the Mississippi River in that time period. And so the promise of land, uh, cheap and available land, is an awfully good draw to many who had lost their land in Mississippi or Alabama or South Carolina. You see a lot of Texans, uh, Texians, I should say not Texans, but Texians, uh, people who moved to Texas in the 1820s and uh, 30s. You see a lot of folks from South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama, but you also find a lot from the Upper South in Missouri, like the Austins are, Tennessee or Kentucky. They come to Texas some way or another. And the, 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 uh, the statement, gone to Texas was true, GTT, gone to Texas, uh, and a lot of folks come when the promise of cheap and available land. And to give you an idea of why Texas was attractive, and you may be thinking, wasn't there cheap and available land in America? Yes, uh, we, we would think so, but the uh, terms were oftentimes far harder uh, to get than what you found in, under the Mexican colonization laws that uh, Austin and others are going to employ. Uh, for example, uh, arrival to Texas in the 1820s as far as settlement, uh, arrival to Texas in the 1830s, but especially here in the 20s uh, where we are, that's going to be, uh, that'll that might uh, rival Texas as far as drawing folks from the United States, and people do move there, uh, is the state of Arkansas. Now, most people, most Texans would never think of Arkansas being a rival to Texas uh, in the sense of uh, uh, where would you rather live, but Arkansas, in all honesty, is a very beautiful state, uh, and I say that can you make money there? Yeah, that's an arguable uh, point. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is beautiful, especially you get up around the University of Arkansas or Bentonville, where, which is right down the road from the University of Arkansas, where Walmart is headquartered. Anyways, all those Ozark stuff, they have, uh, they have fall and seasons up there that we Texans generally don't know anything about. But Arkansas was, uh, go, it was offering land for sale. 
And the thing is, is that when we talk about offering land for sale in Arkansas, uh, the federal government and more particularly the Second Bank of the United States, which was the main uh, financial institution in the U.S. at that point in time, had basically uh, put the kibosh on uh, a lot of he had put the kibosh on a lot of uh, spending and a lot of speculative spending on land because what they're going to they the second bank of the united states in philadelphia and the ripple effect goes out from there they're going to start to require uh, payment on loans and payments on lands the federal government will do this too uh, in the form of specie meaning gold and silver uh, and not just some sort of perhaps flimsy bank notes uh, they, see, they understand the thing about the United States in and around the time of the Austin, uh, the rise of Stephen Austin and the rise of the impresarios in Texas, uh, is is that a, uh, you, you had a cur two basic currency systems. You had on the one hand the specie, meaning gold and silver that you could pay in, which was frankly scarce. Uh, but then also you're going to have, especially prior to the panic of 1819, you're going to have a bank si banknote system where you would be paying. It's, it's kind of like a, a precursor to a check, uh, but you're basically paying banknotes, and they would act as cash. But you'd pay banknotes uh, to, uh, to somebody uh, and say, all right, I've got money in the bank. Here's a banknote. Well, it's nice and good, uh, if, especially if you know the, the person in town. Let's say if you're a, value, a wealthy man, Say at Andrew Jackson, for an example, in Nashville, and Jackson hands you a bank note, you know that's pro pretty much uh, nearly gold because that man is wealthy, he's prominent, it's a major bank, etc., and it's all good. The thing, however, is the further you get away from home and the further you get away from that bank, the value of that uh, note goes down and down and down, especially if you don't, uh, if you don't know the man. So if you ever heard of the bank and you don't know the man, you may say, yeah, I'll take your bank note, but I'll give you 10 cents on the dollar. So uh, these banknotes acted as a currency in the United States prior to the panic, and even after the panic, too, to be clear. Uh, but after the panic, the, a lot of those banks dried up, and a lot of people lost their shirts and lost their money. And so back to Arkansas, payment was, uh, was required in the form of gold and silver. And you may think, well, okay, but again, gold and silver is scarce as far as uh, currency. The, then the thing, too, is, is that they asked for a dollar and a quarter an acre. And you may think in Arkansas, and you may think, my gosh, a dollar and a quarter an acre, you think bonanza gold. I mean, I've got all this land. But dollar and a quarter acre ain't cheap, uh, is not cheap land in the, in the United States. And frankly, because of the specie issue, it was hard to get a hold of. So it, it hurt Arkansas uh, to move to, uh, it hurt Arkansas when you had that dollar and a quarter land uh, cost plus the specie issue, and, uh, and, and on and we can go. The thing, though, is, is Arkansas does have a chip to play and has a card to throw uh, in the, uh, the, the attraction of settlers. And one of the things is, is that they can say with a straight face is, is that if you, meaning if you are a settler and you move from Alabama or uh, Kentucky or somewhere and you want to move and start over again, Arkansas is a part of the United States. Arkansas has a stable uh, uh, judicial system, and Arkansas does not have Indian troubles. You move to Texas, you're moving to a, a new nation in Mexico that is unstable, and obviously they, depo they depose uh, Interbedi, uh, they meaning the Mexican leadership, the Mexican elite, uh, depose Interbedi within one year uh, after being coronated as uh, emperor for life sort of thing. And so he's already out. Uh, you also have an unstable, uh, not only body politic, but your judicial system in Texas is non-existent. So what does a title look like? That's a good question. You don't know. I mean, unless you have a title to the land, you don't own the land. You can't, you can point to it all day long and say that's mine. But legally speaking, you got to have a legal document showing that these meets and bounds are yours. And then thirdly, there is the issue of uh, hostile Indians, whether it's Comanche or some other tribe. That is, uh, that is certainly a case in Texas. It can go sideways for you rather quickly. So there will be Americans who will look at Arkansas as the preferable choice over Texas uh, in this 1820s time period. But many, many, many individuals won't. You'll call the first group of settlers to Texas, the old 300 under Austin, but there will be thousands more legal and illegal who will come to Texas and settle with a hope of getting rich quick, the hope of establishing a new life, the hope of doing it the right way, whatever that is, a hope of becoming Mexican citizens and getting a, a lot of princely uh, land and, and restarting. But Austin comes back to Texas. 
Austin comes back to uh, and said, basically says, we're open for business. And there had been some rumors that Austin had died or had been imprisoned in Mexico City, but anyways, that was not the case. But what Austin can offer is a very generous thing, and this is really, in a sense, the linchpin of what draws so many to Texas over Arkansas, uh, is despite all the issues with the judiciary and the legal system, despite the issues with the body politic of Mexico City, despite the issues of hostels uh, on the uh, plains or in the neighborhood, meaning uh, the hostile Indians, the thing is, is that Austin can look you square in the face and say, I've got a law uh, that has been passed, and I know the details of it because I helped draft it. I know all the, all the people they know me, they like me, I like them, and I can do all the work for you. You need, just need to pay me 12 and a half cents an acre. And that's, that was that, 12 and a half cents an acre. And oh, by the way, you don't have to pay me in gold and silver, though that would be really nice. The thing is, you, uh, and by the way, if, if, if you'd walked in with a bag full of gold and silver and said, give me, my, give me land, Austin would have done backflips down the, uh, the hallway uh, at Fort. Austin was willing to trade for anything of value, which was most of the Texas economy then anyways, especially in these frontier situations. Beeswax and guns and gunpowder, livestock and other things, uh, basically anything that was barterable and had value, you could uh, trade for. And that would, that would count as payment. But 12 and a half cents an acre is good stuff. And on top of that, the Mexicans are very generous now, very generous compared to the United States. They're going to offer uh, to the head of a household, uh, when you boil it down and down, it comes out to this, 4,428 acres of land. If you are going to come as a, as a head of a household, and they, that was really kind of one of the things. The Mexicans don't want these fly-by-nighters. They don't want a James Bowie type. The Mexicans want good, solid individuals. They want families to come and settle Texas. That's the goal, and that's the initial thing is we don't want just uh, uh, these schemers and dreamers in here. We want real families who are going to drop roots into Texas and become good uh, subjects of uh, Mexico or good citizens of Mexico, excuse me. And, oh, by the way, they need to become Catholic. That's a minor con inconvenience for most. Most of these uh, are Protestant, uh, and most of them will do what they need to do. They'll uh, nod when they need to nod. There's not a really, there's a Catholic church in Texas. Uh, there's a couple Catholic churches in Texas at the time, but there's not a, tr uh, a priest uh, that's always in the neighborhood. So it, that is a regulation that's not all that enforced. And that 4,428 acres is called a league. So you will get a league of land. A 4,428 acres, that is a princely sum. You couldn't touch that in the United States, frankly. And on top of it, not only that, if you also uh, um, had a little farming in your blood, you could get a little extra land for it, so you could get uh, another 177 acres, which is called a labor. A league and a labor, as we uh, in Texas history refer to it as, a league and a labor. So 4,428 acres is a league of land for your ranching purposes, so to speak, uh, and also a labor would be 177 acres. Uh, the reality is is that uh, there would be expectation that some of them, these guys are going to end up not running cattle or, or other livestock. They're probably going to, especially if it's in, uh, along the, the riverbanks and such, they're going to try to uh, raise cotton on it. But you're going to have... Uh, other products growth, grown as well, livestock, and so on. So 4,428 is the league, 177 is the labor, and that is the basics of it. Uh, Austin is, going to, is uh, going to be what's called an impresario. And I've used that term already in this lecture several times, and you may be wondering what exactly is an impresario. An impresario is essentially a land agent. He is going to be the organizing authority. He is essentially not only just a land agent. Uh, that casts too narrow of a, of a net for what Austin can do. Austin is going to have initially, he's going to have authority, more or less complete authority over his colony. He's going to be one part general, one part judge, one part uh, police officer, one part uh, land agent. Uh, basically, anything that needs to be done in your neighborhood, any complaint you have goes to Austin uh, and drops on his desk. Now, these, these uh, colonies, and there's many of them, tech, Austin's is the most successful of them all. Austin's the most prominent of them all. But all these colonies are going to need to have what we'll call a capital. It's not formally the capital of Texas. Capital of Texas is in Bejar at this point in time, but the, or excuse me, the capital of Texas under the Spanish would be in Bejar. Uh, when it's under Mexico, the capital of Texas is a, because Texas is attached to Coahuila. 
Uh, it's Coahuila E. Texas is the state, actually, and so it will be in uh, Saltillo first and then later Monclova. But the thing is, is that when you talk about Texas uh, under the, uh, the impresarios and even after the law changes a little bit, let's talk about what it's like to live in Austin's colony or any of these other uh, colonies that are going to spring up in the 1820s or the 30s. So you live there and you live there and you're going to say, well, who do I deal with on the government side? As I said a minute ago, initially you're going to deal with the impresario himself. Reality is, is that Mexico City and the issues in Mexico City are far way away and they're probably not going to bother you too much uh, anyhow. Uh, stuff on the state level could be a bit of an issue, especially with regard to land, because the state is going to be given the authority to, uh, to handle the land question, at least for a while in the 20s. But uh, So even still then, you're not going to deal with the state all that much. So the locals is where you go. But after about 1828, I believe it was, you're going to see Austin uh, be divested, and all these impresarios, especially after the colony gets off the ground, uh, they're going to be divested of some of the more uh, annoying uh, and time-consuming aspects of being an impresario, such as being a judge and being a, a proverbial mayor and a county judge and a sh law enforcement and a general and so on. Austin, for all intents and purposes, is all too happy uh, to get rid of that sort of thing, and he wants to essentially, uh, essentially create in his uh, colony a local sustaining government. The capital of Austin's colony, to be clear, is going to be the, uh, the little community of San Felipe. San Felipe to Austin. It sits on the high bank of the Brazos River. San Felipe, F-L-E, F-E, excuse me, F-E-L-I-P-E, -E, San Felipe. It's real close to present-day Sealy, uh, Belleville territory out around there. So anyways, uh, San Felipe de Austin sits on the high bank of the Brazos River, uh, and you're going to have what are called ayuntamientos. Uh, that's all, this is in your textbook. Uh, the ayuntamiento, which is kind of like a, a, a mix between a county commissioner's court and the town and city council. So it's, it's not exactly analogous or one-to-one, -one, but it's like that. Uh, and then at the head of the ayuntamiento, which uh, who, he, this man is going to serve as a... Uh, a judge, he's going to be law enforcement, he's going to be a half a dozen things. He's kind of a mix between a sheriff, a county judge, and a mayor. That guy's name or that man's na title is the Alcalde, A-L-C-A-L-D-E. And you're going to have uh, that, that title, the Alcalde, is a big one. It's really important. In fact, actually, as you get through the 1820s and get into the 1830s, if you had an issue with regard to uh, governance, that's probably who you're going to contact. You're going to get a hold of the Alcalde and, and uh make your complaint there. So uh, that's, the, that's a government sense in, in right there. Um, when we talk about uh, scarcity of money just a minute ago, one of the major problems for Texas will be, uh, and this is true even into the Republic period of the 1830s and 40s, is, is that you're going to have a scarcity of, of specie, just not a lot of cash just laying around, not a lot of hard currency. Uh, what you do have, and especially early on in Mexican history before it becomes the peso, uh, is the old Spanish uh, real, the old Spanish real. It's, it's a, literally a milled piece of silver. And the Spanish real, uh, to give you an idea how creaky and how uh, backward the Spanish uh, currency situation was, is that you're literally going to, uh, you're, you know, you're going to have to, to pay for things that are worth less than one real. Uh, there, the term is uh, a, a milled piece. And so how do you get a piece? And some of you are familiar with this because literally what they'll do in, in cases in Texas and elsewhere, this is not unique to Texas, is you'll take that Spanish real, especially early on, you want to pay for it for this worth less than one real, you hit it with a hammer, you crack it, and you hand a bit. Um, for those of you from junior high uh, era, you remember maybe it was in, even in high school, you were a cheerleader, you heard the, the old saw goes two bits, four bits, six bits a dollar, and you wonder what the heck's a bit. A bit is tw literally 12 and a half cents in, in Texas terminology or Texas law or American law now. But literally in the old days before it was codified, a bit was literally when that guy took the hammer and cracked that real or whatever he, uh, denomination he was cracking, he broke off a bit and paid two bits. There you go. Now he's paid. So that's uh, pretty primitive. And so at the end of the day, uh, you're seeing some upgrades. But Texas was still backwards in that sense. It was still uh, hard up for hard currency. It couldn't get any. 
But uh, to live in these colonies uh, is uh, quite an interesting experience. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, you did need land. And I really need to hit this as the last point of this lecture uh, today, uh, is, is that you need your land title. Now, Austin himself does issue the titles uh, in a sense, but the real, in a sense, arguably at times, I've heard some historians that I really respect uh, say this, that the, more, the most important individual you needed in a colony was not uh, the impresario. That's certainly nice, and they get a lion's share of discussion, and, and rightfully so, I would say. Uh, but you need a land commissioner. And if you don't have a land commissioner, you can't issue titles. If you don't have a land commissioner under the, the colonization laws of Mexico, you don't have land. Uh, you have to have a la functioning land commissioner. So Austin, uh, who is, again, the most successful and the most uh, organized, frankly, of all the land, uh, uh, the land commissioners and the impresarios, more particularly in Texas, is going to have really two uh, men working for him as land commissioners. The first man was his, old, uh, his father's old business partner and becomes Austin's business partner, uh, Stephen Austin's business partner, and that is the Baron de Bastrop. And so for a handful of years, a couple, three years, uh, Stephen Austin will be working with the Baron de Bastrop as the land commissioner. And the land commissioner of Texas, uh, excuse me, land commissioner Austin Colony is going to issue all the titles to the old 300 and others. The second man is far more controversial uh, in Texas history in the 1820s and especially the 1830s as he becomes uh, himself a prominent individual. He is uh, far less uh, a man of scruples uh, than Austin was. Uh, if I haven't said it already, Austin is a really an honest man. He's single for all his life. Uh, his, his, he's married to the Texas Project, uh, and Austin was never quite the uh, rake uh, that, say, uh, um, Jim Bowie was or William Barrett Travis. Uh, to my knowledge, Austin was kind of a, uh, just a quiet man uh, in the evening sort of thing. But anyways, uh, but Samuel May Williams, Austin's second uh, uh, land commissioner, Samuel May Williams comes to Texas in the 20s as kind of a runaway um, like a lot of people come to Texas to get away or to run away, and May Williams or Samuel May Williams is going to make himself uh, quite a fortune in Texas land speculation and so on, and at times it seems like he stole, and especially in the 30s now, he stole some land from people who had a rightful title. It's, it's a, there's a whole lot of squabbling over land in Texas, and, but he was the second land commissioner, and there's a whole lot to be said about May Williams. Well, anyways, uh, but if you're going to have a title, you need to know where your land is. And so this, uh, the, uh, the last part of the story is about getting your t uh, title. Uh, you're going to need, uh, a, you're going to need surveyors. And these surveyors will come to Texas. Some of our America, most of them are from America, but some from Mexico. But you need to survey your land out so that you know where the meets and the bounds are, uh, where your land starts and where your land stops, in other words. And they're going to measure it, put this in your notes, uh, in the form of a vara, V-A-R-A, a vara. A vara is, uh, if I was in the classroom, I'd literally step back and take a step. A vara, one vara is literally one step. Now, here's like the milled piece, like the Spanish real. What's the problem with a vara? Well, formally, by the way, get this out of the way. Formally, in Texas, the Congress of Texas in 1836 declares a vara a 33 and a third inches. 33 and a third inches. So the vara is legally in 1836, this is the Republic of Texas, it becomes a 33 and a third uh, inch uh, measurement. But prior to the Republic, you're going to have the vara as, okay, so and so many varas from found rock here on top of hill to tree over there, and you're going to have this, uh, these surveyors just taking steps, and they're just calling them varas. Vara 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 500 vara, whatever the uh, number would be. So in a sense, if especially after you codify it all and say it's 33 and a third inches, you they'll look at, oh, well, how do you... Um, how do you, you know, who would you have preferred? Would you have preferred a little small man to give you a, a vara, or would you prefer the big guy who's got a big, long uh, step? So there's going to be a, a lot of lawyers are going to make a lot of money in the history of Texas, especially after the Mexican period, uh, in lawsuits over who's, where does the land start and stop. I mean, to this day, you hear about the uh, land office in uh, Austin participating in arguments between these old families in East Texas or Central Texas 
arguing over where the land starts and stops at. Uh, but that vara is what everything is measured on, and some and one of my books on the shelf behind me refers to it as the variable vara, and that's essentially true. So you measured your land out in varas under the Mexican and, and the first Spanish and then later Mexican practice. All in Spanish, you have your land commissioner, and then you paid impresario Austin in something that would have had value, and you're underway. So that's a, that's a lay of the land sort of idea of what it's like to live in Texas, uh, or at least the start of how it's like to live in Texas under the, uh, the Mexican period and under the impresario system. So we'll pick up and we'll go and talk about some of the other impresarios in the next lecture.